we do that right now? Lord Jesus, we want to say thank you for this day and the time we have to be together. Thank you, Lord God, for uh, the opportunity to gather in your name with this church family of ours. And Father, we're just going to pray for those on our right and on our left, and we're praying right now. Lord, have your way. Lord, you do good and perfect things. Minister to the bodies, minister to the minds and the hearts, minister to the families, minister to the finances. Lord God, those that are traveling, keep them safe. And Lord, I just pray right now that you would be moving in each one of our lives according to the different things that we have spoken or have not spoken. And God, do it in such a way that, Lord God, your people get the benefit. But Jesus, we want you to get all the credit. We want you, Lord God, to be high and lifted up because you're the one that meets the need and takes care of. Let bodies be healed right now in Jesus' name. Let minds be restored to peace right now in Jesus' name. And that, Father, we're just believing and declaring right now that you are God, you're on your throne, and you are moving right now. And Father, I just want to give you thanks, I want to give you praise, I want to give you glory right now, because I believe there are testimonies waiting to happen, Lord God, on the other side of this service. And Father, we want to give you praise right now for it, in Jesus' name, amen, amen. Y'all may be seated. As you remember some of these prayer requests, lift them up to God, because how you know your prayers, the Bible says, are powerful and effective. And so we want you praying for all these things as, as you remember them. We got a number of things to cover real quick. Turn with me to Book of Ruth, chapter 1, is where we're going to be tonight. And uh, But I need to address some stuff. Don't forget, we need Easter candy. Uh, somebody gave me a $50 check for, uh, for Easter candy made out to the church. Uh, if you say, uh, Brother Mike, I can't get to the store, but I can help pay for some. Hey, we, we take cash. We take credit cards. We take gold, diamonds, <laughs> platinum, uh, title deeds. I, I'm, hey, you know, we're a very versatile group of people. But uh, we need some candy so we can stuff the eggs. And uh, uh, somebody, at, oh, uh, Sandy was asking because the teenagers are going to be stuffing them because that's kind of like community service, you know. Do the eggs or do the time? And and so some of y'all, she said, can anybody stuff eggs? And I said, absolutely, absolutely, because some of y'all got a lot of sin in your life you got to work off. <laughs> Jesus' blood only covers so much. You know what I'm saying? And some of y'all, some of y'all done taxed your limit. So, hey, at this church, praise the Lord. Hey, hey, simmer down. You're not up here. I am. Hush, <laughs> hush. So, no, get us some candy so we can stuff the eggs so we can tell, uh, tell people about Jesus on Sunday and, and, and uh, let the kids have a good time here at the church. However you know, you need to have a good time at church. You don't need to be a sourpuss at church. Turn to somebody next to you and say, you need to simmer down. <laughs> All right. Um, <laughs> out, out in the lobby on a table... Uh, this coming Sunday is a number of things. It's St. Patrick's Day. Uh, anybody pinches me is going to get popped. I'm telling you right now. No pinching. Ain't no pinching. Uh, I'll have green on. I'll have green on. I promise you. But some of y'all just mean. So it don't matter. You're just going to crab claw your way around the sanctuary. Why are you pointing at Mike? <laughs> wow. That's Pinchy Mike, go ahead. Go right ahead. Um, in the back, back there is uh, to get ready for a business meeting. There's a copy of uh, our last quarter uh, that was back in December. There's a copy of the minutes from the last one. There is an agenda for the coming meeting, and that's all out there, so you can avail yourself to it. Don't forget those of you that were here Sunday. If you, uh, I ask all my educators, whether you are faculty, staff. Uh, janitor, dietitian, school bus driver, if you work for a school district, we were giving away these surveys right here to help us. Uh, uh, we want to make an impact this coming school year uh, at Florence High School. We're kind of piloting a program here. To We want to see teachers stay in Florence. Amen. We don't want to see them leaving anymore. And uh, so I'm asking for those of you that can, be sure to fill that in and turn it 
uh, turn it into the church office. Um, we do have this this coming Sunday is a business meeting. The following is Palm Sunday. Have no Easter's right up on us. It's quick this year. Palm Sunday, we'll be having a special service in here. We did it last year called the Whip, Hammer, and Cross. It's an illustrated sermon of Jesus' last hours here on earth. And uh, so it's a very moving time and a good time for folk to get saved when they see what Jesus did for them. And uh, so I want to encourage you to be here for that. Of course, then Easter Sunday is the last Sunday of this month. And uh, y'all, y'all be here for that. We do have... Um, Billy, is she, is she going to try to have quilting tomorrow? Okay. All right. So she'll take care of that. We got the youth going camping on uh, Friday and Saturday. Uh, I was invited to go camping with the teenagers. I was disinclined to go camping with the teenagers. <laughs> My idea of camping is like Comfort Inn and Sweets. Y'all with me on that? Okay. I, I, am, I am not a sleeping bag on the ground. No, sir. No, ma'am. Did that, and I, I don't have to do that. So, um, but if you, if you didn't get a bulletin out there, there's a number of other things. Uh, the young adults have a, have a get-together coming up. Parables in the Park is coming up. And uh, uh, the rodeo, I almost said church rodeo. The Colleen Rodeo feels like the church rodeo. It really does because so many of us are a part of it. And uh, I want to I'm gonna give a testimony real quick. Amanda's here. And uh, Amanda, wave your hand real quick. I want to thank God for this lady right here because she came up to me and she said, Brother Mike, I got an idea. All right, let's hear it. She said, I would like to do a rodeo event at the rodeo for special needs kids. And so she found out the Heart of Texas one in Waco uh, about last fall said, hey, let's go look at it, see, see what they do, because they've been doing it for 20-something years. And so my wife and I and, and her, we went out there and spied out the land and looked at it. Can I tell you right now, that looked like, that looked like Maxdale Cowboy Church Fall Fest. I mean, it's about everything we do. Matter of fact, I think we got all the stuff. We sat down today and put all the, the stations, and I think we got everything short of the horses uh, that they need for therapy. But uh, so we, we decided we're going to do this, and so she's been master planning it. And so, yes. So last month, last month, we went before the rodeo committee. Part, we're on that. And so we just kind of cast a vision. Hey, we'd like to do this on a Saturday morning from 10 to, 10 to 12 and, uh, where people can, can bring their special needs kids to come in and have a rodeo experience. And, uh, and so this past Monday, uh, uh, I went to the, our rodeo committee meeting and uh, uh, she, was, she was barrel racing with her daughter. And uh, I got in there and suddenly, I mean, it's, uh, we need to talk about this. We need to talk about that. We want to support this. Cavenders is over here going, we want to give away free straw hats and stuff, stuff, stuff. And 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 then Murdoch's is over here going, hey, wait, wait, no, we're going to give this stuff. And, we're, and I'm just like, hey, give me one, give me one, give me the two, 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 give me, give me two, two, give me the three, 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 give me three, give me three, give me three, give me three, you know, I'm ready to do a bidding war right here. And uh, uh, somebody turns around. I'm on the board for the for Special Olympics for Central Texas. And uh, what can I do? And, and it's just like pow, 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 pow. And it's just one of those things you begin to organically say, hey, wait a minute. <laughs> I think God's in this. I think God's in this. So I want to give a I want to give a special recognition to that lady for having the heart for this. That I believe is going to make a good impact, a good impact in our community. So, May the eighteenth is the Saturday of our um, of our rodeo. There is actually, if you have that bulletin, there's a handout in there, 
And uh, matter of fact, you can take that hand out, take it somewhere, have them tape it up in the window and just help us to get the word out. Yes, sir. Easter breakfast, okay, and I, I've been meaning to text y'all on this because I had an idea, I'm running with it, and but y'all are cooking it. Okay, so, <laughs> so here's, here's the thought, is, is all the breakfast on Easter Sunday um, to not cancel Sunday school, okay, but to start cooking, uh, be able to serve by nine, is that doable? Okay, to start serving by nine so those that want to go to Sunday school can and those that straggle in late, theirs is cold. Ha, ha, ha. Should have come to Sunday school. No, but is that okay? Is that good? All right, so yes, Easter Sunday morning, we have breakfast. Matter of fact, I think it's on the announcement loop, but uh, we do have breakfast that morning. What, what, what's on that breakfast? Pancakes and sausage. Bacon, pancakes, and sausage. Bacon, hash brown, pancakes, <laughs> sausage. What? <laughs> I'm kidding. The other cook. Okay. Would that be yourself, sir? Okay. Paul Hopkins, <laughs> that'd be our, our Paul, okay. All right, well, tell you what, I'll talk to Treva. <laughs> It'll get handled. <laughs> It'll get handled. All right, let's move on. We got, we got ground to cover. We got ground to cover. So in the study of Ruth, we studied this last week, made an introduction into it, and uh, uh, I love this story. It's like the ultimate love story. And uh, it's a beautiful, beautiful book, uh, even used on the college level. It's that it's that it's actually that good of literature. And uh, I want us to remember some of what we saw last time. So uh, whenever you study scripture, this specifically, but really when you're studying any scripture, there are four levels of study that that you need to be looking at. The first one deals with the primary application, and that's the historical value of it. Because how you know the Bible is a history book? I believe it's if, if it's in there, it happened. Okay, so if uh, so, you study the history of it, and bear in mind that when you're reading the Bible, you got to read it in the context of the day and the age it was written in. Now, does it apply to today? Yes, it does. But you need to remember the context it was written in, okay? And uh, don't try to Americanize it. It is what it is, and it, and it doesn't conform to us. We conform to it. Now, the second thing is the practical application, where you do apply it to your own life. You ask yourself, so what? I've read this scripture, so what? what how does it... Uh, apply to me? How do I make this a part of my life? Because how you know Scripture is supposed to be guiding how you live? It's not about what you hear on TV. It's not about what you read on Facebook. Okay? Well, I got a better amen out of that one. What matters is what does the Word of God have to say about it? It doesn't matter about denominations. It doesn't matter about Pastor Mike, which I would like to think all of us have been praying about this. But at the end of the day, it's you and the Word of God. I believe God speaks to us. I do. I do believe that He has a voice. Uh, uh, John chapter 10, Jesus said, Jesus, red letters, Jesus said, My sheep know my voice. And I believe that's a very literal thing. The, the, the Lord does speak to our heart. He does speak to our heart. However, He also speaks through His Word. In, any, in case there's anything in your mind and the Bible that conflicts, you will always go with the Bible. Okay? Always. Third thing is the prophetic revelations, the mystical and prophetic insights, that which is to come, those sort of things. And then lastly is a Hebrew word. Uh, I appreciate Dr. Chuck Missler with his studies because this is 
uh, where I, I glean my material from. I enjoy him. Uh, uh, but he, he talks about how in the Hebrew culture, they have this word called remez. And remez means it's the hint of something deeper. It's a parallel, okay? Kind of like the, uh, the people were getting bit by the snakes. And so God told Moses, put the serpent, the bronze serpent up in the air. What was that a parallel of? Christ on the cross, okay? And so there's there's parallels. It's remez. It's something, if, if you're paying attention, there's something else that's, it parallels it. It's symbolism, something like that. So when you're reading the Bible, consider that. Now this chapter tonight, what we're looking at is uh, uh, you can split up, uh, you can split up Ruth into four things, love's resolve, Love's response, love's request, and then love's reward. And there is a bonus study that is done uh, that you could do that deals with love's redemption. Go back into it and check that out. Now, we're going to be looking at love's resolve here. And this is Ruth cleaving to Naomi, her mother-in-law. Now, the main background of, of Ruth is the famine condition. Okay, that's... That's the background for the entire thing. That's what's making all this happen is this famine that has invaded the land. We talked about this last week, okay? How it was such an incredible famine that it was located within the borders of Israel and doesn't go out. How do you know locusts don't know boundaries? Fire doesn't know boundaries. Flood doesn't know boundaries, okay? It just moves until it can't. Well, so a famine is the same thing, except for the fact you find out the famine was only located there because right across the street, almost literally, is Moab, and Moab has food. Israel does not. I believe there was a judgment that was taking place in Israel at that time. We talked about it. Now this famine caused Elimelech to leave Israel for Moab. You can see on that map, and uh, the sons of Elimelech and Naomi married Moabite women, and this was a forbidden practice. It was a no-no, you don't do that. So this, these are the themes behind this entire story. Some of the stuff that, that we have to wrap our brain around and ask certain questions. And that is, was this God's plan? Was this man's failure? Or was this simply a place for grace to take place? Because when you read the Bible in the Old Testament, there's not a lot of grace in it. There is grace in it, but not near as much as the New Testament. Okay. Now, let's, let's jump in. We're going to look at uh, chapter 1, verse 6. We're going to start here. Then now, Naomi heard in Moab that the Lord had blessed His people in Judah by giving them good crops again. So Naomi and her daughters-in-law got ready to leave Moab and return to their homeland. With her two daughter-in-laws, she set out from the place where she had been living, and they took the road that would lead them back to Judah, uh, specifically Bethlehem. Uh, in, the, in the King James Version, it says that she heard uh, there in verse 6, where it says that there were good crops again. In the King James, it says that there was bread. She heard there was bread. That's actually significant because uh, Bethlehem literally means house of bread. She heard there was bread in the house again. When Jesus was born, where was He born? What was one of the titles of bread that Jesus had? He is the bread of life. So it's interesting that in this story, bread was back in the house. And after that, it led to blessings in Israel. And then in Jesus' time, there was silence. God hadn't been speaking. It was a famine of God's presence. And suddenly, there's bread in the house of bread again, which led to what? Blessings in Israel. That's Ramez. That's Ramez right there. These parallels of these stories, how it ties with Jesus Christ. Now, verse number 7. 
uh, 8. But on the way, Naomi said to her two daughter-in-laws, Go back to your mother's homes, and may the Lord reward you to your kindness, the kindness to your husbands and to me. May the Lord bless you with the security of another marriage. Then she kissed them goodbye, and they all broke down and wept. No, they said, we want to go with you to your people. But Naomi replied, why should you go on with me? Can I still give birth to other sons who could grow up to be your husbands? No, my daughters, return to your parents' home, for I am <clears throat> too old to marry again. And even if it were possible that I were to get married tonight and bear sons, then what? Would you wait for them to grow up and refuse to marry someone else? No, of course not, my daughters. Things are far from... Uh, uh, Things are far more bitter for me than for you because the Lord Himself has raised His fist against me. Now that's an interesting thought right there. When she describes it this way, she's describing her own life and she says, this is a bitter time for me because the Lord Himself has raised His hand against me. What is she sensing there? I'm being judged. I'm being judged by God and I deserve it. I deserve it. The, that judgment was upon her husband, upon her sons, and upon herself. And uh, interesting that she sees it that way and, and, and uh, could very well be. I don't know. Now, the um, verse 14, and they again they wept together and Orpah kissed their uh, mother-in-law goodbye, but Ruth clung tightly uh, to Naomi. Look, Naomi said to her, your sister-in-law has gone back to her people and her gods. You should do the same. That word of cling to in the King James, they call it cleaving. That uh, in the Hebrew, it means to stick like a glue. Ruth would not leave her mother-in-law. Now that creates connotations for us here in American culture. Yeah. Yes, thank you, Siri. Help me out. Help me out there. This is... <laughs> so, it's interesting because in our culture, who's the villain of the family a lot of times? The mother-in-law. It's a mother-in-law's house. We're out back. So she's not in the house with us. You know, we... We pick on mother-in-laws. I got a good mother-in-law. I really do. She likes me better than her daughter. But, <laughs> but the this is an interesting thought because how many how many women how many because you married her baby boy. If you've married a woman's baby boy, you know sometimes mama can get in the way. You don't have to say amen. It's all right. Sorry, especially if your relatives are here. The uh, so if if you married her child and the child died and you could go home, but you chose to stay with your mother-in-law. Now that's odd. I'm telling you that is odd because especially in that culture, because you would go back to your people, especially when you're of crossed cultures. You're Israeli, Hebrew. And we're Moabites. I mean, they, they fought for years, years. And, and so that, and it makes me wonder, was life so bad at her home that life appeared that much better with her mother-in-law? Even with all the stuff her mother-in-law has gone through, it's still better here than where I came from. Not just a thought. That's not in, in the Word of God. But I like to look behind the scenes and say, what would make this woman leave her country, leave her people, leave her family, leave everything she knows to dwell in another land as an immigrant and look down upon, because you're not a Hebrew, just to be with her mother-in-law? Does anybody else see that? It's a very, very odd connotation there. It's something that you don't want to just gloss over. Not only did she just say, ah, yeah, I'll go with you. No. Cleaved, stuck like glue. Okay? Now, the very cause that induced Orpah to return home is the same thing that caused uh, Ruth to stay. 
Why did one leave and why did one stay? And it says that Orpah even cried. She really didn't want to leave her mother-in-law. That, that speaks to me about the mother-in-law. How about you? That, that your daughter-in-laws love you. They want to be with you. That's wonderful. But it's also something that's indicative is this. She is a widow and she has no children to take care of her. Read the Bible historically in its context. If you were a widow, women already didn't have a whole lot of rights in, in the Middle Eastern culture back in that day. Widows had none. Because if you don't have a husband, then it's your children's uh, issue to take care of you, not anybody else's. And if you don't have kids, you're really in dire straits. You got a problem. And I think Ruth saw this. Ruth knew this. And it's not just Hebrew culture. I think that kind of bled through the borders. But she knew nobody was going to be there to take care of her. Therefore, I'm going to be with her. So it's, it's kind of a love. To me, it looks like love and duty put together. Now, uh, where are we at? Verse 14. And they wept together. Orpah kissed her mother-in-law goodbye, but Ruth clung tightly to Naomi. Look, uh, your sister-in-law has gone back to her people and her gods. You should do the same. Now, when it says her gods, Orpah went back to her people and what? Her gods. Go back to that. I think here's Naomi. She knows the one God of Israel. That's what she knows. But she's been in the land of the Moabites. There's a whole lot of other gods specifically the national God, the one God that's really the biggest of all of them, was a God by the name of Chemosh. We see that in Numbers 2 to, uh, 21, 1 Kings chapter 11. They talk about the worship of Chemosh and that Chemosh was actually uh, uh, very approving of human sacrifices in 2 Kings chapter 3. This is noted on a piece of sculpture uh, called the Moabite Stone. The Moabite stone, we're going to take a little tra rabbit trail here. The Moabite stone, is a, it's a black uh, uh, basalt memorial that's engraved uh, that was discovered in the territory of Moab uh, by a German missionary in 1868. It's nearly four foot tall and, uh, and it contains about 34 lines of script on it that's all written in, in uh, letters that's very similar to Hebrew. The stone was probably built around 850 B.C. by a guy by the name of King Mesha, who is the king of Moab. Now, his story is the one that's written on this stone. And his story celebrates his overthrow of the nation of Israel. The problem with that is that this is clearly an account of a battle where Israel was victorious in 2 Kings chapter 3. And uh, now the, the passage shows that uh, King Misha honors his God, Chemosh, in terms similar that the Old Testament has reference for the Lord. He really re reveres his God. And, and in order to prove love to Chemosh, uh, the inhabitants of Moab would uh, uh, destroy entire cities, slaughter all the people just to appease their God, and it recalls similar things that, uh, uh, that the Israelites did in the book of Joshua. Okay, it looks a lot like the book of Joshua. Now the Moabite stone uh, has a lot of relevance to it. Historically, it, uh, it confirms the Old Testament records. When you got a Bible and people say that doesn't exist, that doesn't exist, suddenly you find a piece of architecture that's thousands of years old, and guess what it does? It proves that book that's in your hand. Well, y'all just made that up. Well, they made that up thousands of years ago then. So that's, that's why biblical architecture or biblical archaeology is so important. It's because it proves. It proves what the Bible's been saying all along. It's also valuable geographically because it mentions at least 15, uh, uh, 15 sites, 15 communities uh, uh, in the land that the Old Testament references as well. Again, just to prove that the Old Test that the Bible knows what it's talking about. You can actually, if you go to Paris, have you gone to Paris this summer? Anybody just curious? Okay. Well, if you go to Paris, you can stop by the Louvre, and they actually have pieces of this uh, at the Louvre. You can go look at. You're welcome. All right, verse sixteen. 
But Ruth replied, Don't ask me to leave you and turn back. Wherever you go, I will go. Wherever you live, I will live. Your people be my people. Your God will be my God. Wherever you die, I will die. And there I'll be buried. May the Lord punish me severely if I allow anything but death to separate us. Now this is something I noticed a long time ago. Was when I would read that and she would say, May the Lord punish me. And I don't think anything about it till you understand she doesn't know the Lord. She's a Moabitess. She's a Chemosh worshiper amongst other things. And yet, she invokes the name of the Lord. Not only does she just invoke the name of the Lord, she uses the, the term Yehovah. She's, she's using like one of the premier terms that's really used by those that believe in God. She's not saying, eh, God. She's saying, the God. May the God punish me severely. Which makes me wonder. Maybe this was the beginning of the conversion of Ruth. Well, think about that. She's incorporated into the line of Jesus Christ. I think there was a conversion that was taking place, and guess where it started? With her mother-in-law. If there's a mother-in-law in the house, you need to hear me right now. Treat your son-in-laws and daughter-in-laws as Jesus would. You never know you could be leading them to Jesus. The same way that apparently Naomi was leading Ruth to God. That's fascinating to me. Now, when you study this out, there's seven decisions that, uh, that uh, Ruth made. Uh, first of all, she said, where you go, I will go. Where you live, I will live. Your people will be my people. Your God will be my God. Wherever you die, I will die. There I will be buried. And may the Lord punish me severely if I allow anything. That's interesting to me. There's seven statements she makes. That's Ramez. Because what's the one number that keeps really popping up throughout Scripture? The number seven. Uh, the, the heptatic structure of the Bible. You need to pay attention to that. Well, it just so happens that that last statement, may the Lord punish me if anything is allowed but death to separate us. There are actually seven death oaths that are found in the books of Samuel and Kings. And I threw that up there for you. What does that have to do with anything, Brother Mike? I don't know, but it's seven and it works. Hallelujah. So there you go. It's free. Take a picture. It's pretty cool. Now, here's where the problem is. Here's where the rub really comes in. And we find it in Deuteronomy 23, verse 3, where it says this. No Ammonite or what? What is Ruth? Very good. No Ammonite or Moabite or any of their descendants for ten generations may be admitted to the assembly of the Lord. None. Can't happen. It's not going to work. If you're from Ammon, if you're from Moab, forget it. You can't come to church here. It's basically what it's saying. So how could Ruth enter into the congregation of the Lord? What was God thinking. Now, if you're not careful, you'll look at this and say, oh, there's contradictions all in the Word of God. How do you know there are no contradictions in the Word of God? There are contrary opinions, but there are no contradictions in the Word of God. So what was God doing? One, God was trying to keep Israel pure. He was trying to keep Israel pure and not allow those that are not worshipers of God to come in and defile the worship of God by leading it down a rabbit trail it shouldn't be. How do you know the American church is not the church it needs to be? We're in agreement on that. Why? Because we've allowed things into the house of God over the years that should not be in the house of God, like green bean casserole, I agree. So... How could Ruth enter into the congregation of the Lord? And I believe it's by trusting in God's grace and throwing herself at His mercy. Your God will be my God. Well, wait a minute. What does that do? She's no longer a Moabitess. What is she? She's Jewish. She's a Hebrew now. She has changed. Why? Because she's called upon the name of the Lord as her salvation. 
The law excludes us. Us. The law excludes us from God's family. Grace is what helps us get into God's family. Israel is the vine. We are grafted into the vine because of Jesus Christ. The genealogy of Jesus found in Matthew 4 includes five women, four of whom have very questionable <laughs> credentials. They're, they're, they have bad reputations. Tamar committed incest with her father-in-law. Rahab was a Gentile harlot. Ruth was an, an outcast Moabitess. And the wife of Uriah, what was her name? Very good. Bathsheba was an adulteress. All this is in the family line of Jesus. <laughs> All this is in some of our family lines too. Okay, let's just get honest here. There's a, there's a thing, and I, I, I wanted to research this and I forgot. I didn't get time to. But I, I had heard one time in a study where they talked about how the women... The, uh, the 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 uh, Gentile women are mentioned in Jesus' lineage, but the Hebrew women are not. Coffee, brownies, get to work. See if that's right. Uh, uh, if anybody gets a chance to do the study, Bad Girls of the Bible, that is an awesome study. My wife has taught that. She did a fantastic job teaching it. How many ladies were here last night when she was teaching? Did he? Man, I've heard I've heard brags all day long. I, I'm man, I'm I'm ready to let her preach all the time here at church. <laughs> so it stops at home. What? No. Okay. I'm kidding. I'm kidding. Y'all need to if y'all are interested in that, y'all need to let her know. Bad girls of the Bible. It's an incredible study. It really is an incredible study. Now, how did these women ever become a part of the family of the Messiah? I want you to think about that. How did God plan or allow this to happen? And it's simply called grace. Grace allows that to happen. The grace and mercy of God that He's not willing that any would perish, but all would come to repentance. I'd be grateful for God's grace. By God's grace, we're here. By God's grace, we're a part of this family. By God's grace, we're not dead yet. Hallelujah. So in verse 18, we pick up and it says this. When Naomi saw that Ruth was determined to go with her, she said no more. So the two of them continued on their journey when they came to Bethlehem. The entire town was really excited at their arrival. Is this really Naomi, they asked. Bethlehem at this time was probably somewhere around seven to 8,000 people. So it's not, it's not a small town. Uh, uh, especially in their day and age. It was not a small town. But here's the people, when she walks in, they suddenly recognize her. They remember her. Don't know where her husband and boys are, but uh, I remember her sons, uh, uh, Balon and Kilion. We talked about them. One was named, one means puny, and the other one means sickly. Wasn't that right, what we looked at? Puny and sickly. <laughs> terrible, terrible at choosing names for your kids <laughs> this journey just to put this in a perspective for you this journey that Naomi and Ruth took to go from Moab all the way over to Bethlehem is 75 miles on foot and it's not level matter of fact the Moabite highlands they were mountains that they were in they had to go down 4,500 feet to get down into the Jordan Valley, and then they would go back up to Bethlehem, and that means 4,500 feet down, 3,750 feet up. That's not just a lot of walking. That's a lot of hard walking. Through desert territory, through the wilderness lands, there of, of Judah. Verse 20 says, it says, don't call me Naomi, she responded. Instead, call me Mara, for the Almighty has uh, made life very bitter for me. I went away full, but the Lord has brought me home empty. Why call me Naomi when the Lord has caused me to suffer and the Almighty has sent such tragedy upon me? Look at the names here, because again, with the Hebrew culture, names matter. We saw that in the boys, okay? The names matter. 
And so Naomi means pleasant. She's a pleasant woman. And, and again, in the Hebrew culture, remember, read it in its context. Hebrew culture, when you name something, it takes on the meaning of the name. Pleasant. What kind of a woman do you think she grew up to be? Huh? What was, it? was it pleasant? Yeah, pleasant. She grew up to be pleasant. How do I know this? Her daughter-in-laws loved her. They loved her. She was pleasant. But then she, she understands the bitterness she's gone through. She attributes it to God's judgment on her life for their disobedience, for going to Moab in the first place, and then getting Moabite women for their, for their sons, which was forbidden in the law. You can't do it. So God's judgment was upon them, and she is now bitter. She's in bitter circumstances. She's bitter herself. How do you know she just didn't know the end of the chapter? Be very careful when you say, my life's terrible, it's bitter, it's all bad, it's all bad. You don't know what the end of the chapter is. Never give up on God. Because God can totally rewrite your story. My wife and I are testimony of that. God can rewrite your story. And so, uh, let's keep going here. So it says in uh, verse 21, I went out... Uh, 22, so Naomi returned from Moab accompanied by her daughter-in-law, the young Moabite woman. They arrived in Jerusalem in late spring at the beginning of the what? Okay. So I told you last week that uh, the Jewish culture, they save this story and they break it out during the barley harvest. Kind of like we save Christmas music and Christmas stuff for Christmas time. This is a story that's appropriate for the barley harvest because it says right here, there's a hint, all this took place at the beginning of the barley harvest, which happens to be April. How do you know we're in pretty good time to read the book of Ruth? So that's when they would normally study it because barley harvest is just right around the corner, even for us today. And what's interesting, there's a hint here, all this took place. And we know the story. Come on, we've read it. We've read it. It's a lot of, it's a lot of like a Hallmark movie. Oh, there's drama and there's stuff to go through. And, and, uh, and then they wind up together, you know. They wind up together. Oh, it's, it's a good story. I love it. Oh, heart-shaped hands. It's wonderful. <laughs> What's interesting is we know this is exciting. We know it's an exciting story to, taking place. And it took place where? at the beginning of harvest season. Harvest season was always a time to celebrate in, in the culture of Israel. And so this story, you know something good's going to happen. Why? Because it's harvest time. It's harvest time. It's an interesting little thing. God just kind of slipped in there to uh, make the story a little more exciting. So let me ask you this. Let's close with this. What are we discovering, or what, what we are discovering here in this study so far, is the depth and the beauty of God's grace. The depth and the beauty of God's grace. How much grace has God given you? Oh, come on now. Grace, I get what I don't deserve. Mercy, I don't get what I do deserve. I like those two jammed together in a sandwich. Grace and mercy go together. I mean, like, like chocolate chip cookies and coffee. Hallelujah. Chicken and biscuits. I mean, it's, it goes together. I'm grateful for God's grace. Grateful for God's grace. What would you say? Cheetos and Oreos? <laughs> Fritos and bean dip. Well, go ahead. Y'all just take it over with your food concoctions. Let's just see where... <laughs> yeah. Possum and sweet taters. Woo! Yeah. Can't beat it. Slap your mama. Don't get none on your forehead. Your tongue will beat your brains out trying to lick it off. (laughs) 
I'm going to ignore that statement right there. Look, I'm trying to close. Hush. Hush. God's grace is so great. It's so great. We... I had a problem when Mercy Me, I think it's Mercy Me, came out with the song where it talks about God's grace. Celebrate because you just got away with something. Oh, that struck a nerve in my Pentecostal preacher heart. Oh, no. You get away with nothing because you're going to pay a price because that's what we Pentecostals do. We pay prices for everything. Because we... And I see this. We don't fathom grace like it needs to be observed. And pretty soon I quit having a problem with that song because I realized, Cindy, it's right. I got away with something. The blood of Jesus forgave me. Woo! I ought to be in trouble with, with God, my wife, the government, and everybody. But I got away with something. That's what grace does. And it's not something where you, oh, don't worry about it. Just wipe a little grace on it. It's good. (laughs) Wipe a little grace on it. Woo! You know, go ahead and do what you're going to do. Just wipe a little grace on it. You ever gone to the buffet and start praying over your food? Lord, forgive me for what I'm about to do. (laughs) Stop it. (laughs) That's unbiblical, brother. Unbiblical. (laughs) Lord knows I have, Jesus. You're going to have to forgive me. (laughs) Woo! Because it's rib night. Yeah! (laughs) Yeah. But grace, grace is this great thing that when we come to God with a broken heart. See, that's what made David a man after God's own heart. Not because David was good. No. Because David was broken hearted for his sins. David was compassionate and tender. And he wanted, he, he, he knew, God, I'm... I blew it. That's what made him have a heart after God's. God looks at us and says, I need you to have that heart. Accept my grace. Because how you know not everybody accepts grace? The same people that won't accept help is the same people that won't accept grace. You ever met people that, man, they'll, oh, let me help you, let me help you, let me help you, but when it's their turn to be helped, Uh uh-uh stop it you hearing me stop it because you're robbing somebody of a blessing and that same stubbornness hear me now I don't have my glasses on so I can't look at your curmudgeonly faces as you're giving me the, the fish eye but if you're the type of person that refuses a gift from other people especially in the time of need, you're the same one that has a problem receiving grace from Jesus Christ. Why? Because it's a free gift. It's a free gift. Well, I just need to beat myself a little bit. I just need to think negative thoughts about myself. No, you don't. That's the devil's job. That's the devil's job to do those things. That's not your job. Your job is to come to the Father, make things right, get up, dust yourself off, move on. But then that same grace that God gives you, you give to others. Woo! Whole nother sermon. Whole nother sermon. Because we're so glad God is patient with us and doesn't judge us immediately, but He ought to just smack them with some lightning. Make a dump truck fall out of the out of sky on them. Why? Isn't it amazing how we're so grateful God is slow in judgment with us, but then we're frustrated when God doesn't hurry up and punish them. I love the way you're shouting with me. <laughs> Must be telling the truth here. So let's finish. Let's finish here for my third conclusion. Y'all get that later. We need grace. Bow your heads with me. We need grace. Grace, grace, God's grace. Grace that is greater than all of our sin. As the old song says, 
And Lord God, I need grace in my life. I need Your grace to forgive me of my sins. If You're willing to take this Moabite woman that was no good to nobody and yet You turned her around and helped her to live such a life that she literally became a great-grandmother to not just King David, but Jesus Himself. Lord, I want that grace for me. And I would pray, Lord, that as you give me grace, I receive that grace. But as I receive that grace, I learn how to have grace for myself. Nobody hates us like us. God, I pray right now, convict us of our self-hatred and instead begin giving ourselves the grace that God gives us. Help us to forgive ourselves. And then lastly, Lord, I would pray, help us, help me to be gracious with others. Lord, I admit my, my greatest lack of grace is when I'm behind the wheel of my car. I know it. Father, I want grace. Grace that helps me to be patient, tender, kind, loving, thoughtful. All those things that are the fruit of the Spirit, Lord, comes out of that place of grace. So Father, I pray help us. I would pray that you'd help us as a church be a church of grace. We stand for holiness. We do stand for the Word, but we're not ready to just throw the babies out with the bath water. Help us to be a people that will love people in spite of their sins, accepting them while not condoning their sins, but building a bridge of your love and grace that helps the Moabites become the children of God. Yes. Lord, I thank you for this day. I thank you for the time we have. Father, I pray that as we continue in this study, help us to just keep learning more and more about you. Help us to have a wonderful evening. Get everybody home safely. Lord, be with us in whatever the rest of our week looks like. Help us to get it done. And, and then, Lord, I, I pray help us to get back here to church on Sunday, not only ready to experience you, but who knows, maybe we've ministered to somebody this week and we, they can join us in church as well. God, I love you and I thank you for what you do. In Jesus' name, somebody said amen. amen.